Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm going to read the first few verses of 1 Thessalonians 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. I'll stop reading there. Um, we've been looking at 2 Thessalonians 1, and um, we, we want to uh, eventually cover everything we can that relates to Judgment Day, because that's the time we're living in. And uh, we... We haven't spent too much time on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, so I wanted to go over this and, uh, and just go over some of the statements here and see how it relates to our present time. In verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. So God is indicating there's no need to cover this and, uh, and why not? Well, because it is God's plan at the proper time and season to open up His Word, to open up the Scriptures that have been sealed, and He will reveal it to His people. He will show them the things that He has concealed throughout time. As we read in Acts chapter 1, and some people misread this, but it, it says in Acts 1, in verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. So it, here it, it reads, it's not for you. And, and some uh, individuals say, well, you see, this goes along with the idea, no man knows a day or hour. You shouldn't even bother. You shouldn't um, investigate these things or try to figure out when Christ will come. It's not for you to know these things. And yet, that's a mistranslation. It's a mistranslation because it's written in the Greek in the genitive case. And the genitive case is one of possession. It's not of you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in His own power. It doesn't mean that God won't eventually reveal that to you. It just means that, look, you're, you're just a mere man. You're just a creature. You have no idea what the future holds. Only God knows the end from the beginning. Only He knows what is to come. And so it's not of you to know the times and the seasons. But it's not saying at all that we can't know if God is pleased to reveal it to us. And, and He has been pleased to reveal it. That's how we know the church age is over, because God has revealed the time and the season. That's how we, we can know so exactly the 2300 evening mornings of the Great Tribulation followed by the latter rain, and then the conclusion of the 8,400-day Great Tribulation period, because God has revealed the times and the seasons, and it's how now we're learning about the duration of this time period of Judgment Day, that there's a good probability that it will continue for 1,600 days. Well, in verse 2 of First Thessalonians 5, it goes on to say, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 
and, and this um, is often stated, how does a thief come? Well, a thief doesn't give you any forewarning. He doesn't uh, call you to let you know he's coming. He just shows up and, and that's it. And then you're surprised, you're caught off guard. See, no man knows the day or hour. But is God saying that? Is he telling us that? Actually, no, he's not. Christ is coming as a thief because he's coming to steal men's treasure. For anyone who has not uh, hid their treasure in heaven, where a thief and a robber can't break in and steal, if your treasure is on the earth, if your treasure is contained within yourself, and the things you have because you've never become saved, you haven't stored up any heavenly treasure, Christ is coming in the day of judgment to steal everything you have, everything you possess, your very life, everything that, um, that a man was given and what a, that a man obtained during his time in this world will be taken away in the day of the Lord. And yet that uh, the Lord cannot steal and would not steal the treasure of his elect because uh, they are uh, safe and secure uh, through salvation. They have treasure in heaven. And, and, and so the Lord comes as a thief to steal men's treasure in the day of judgment in the night. And we're going to look at both of these um, ideas, that he comes as a thief and that he comes in the night, because that's very significant, that God tells us that, that it's at nighttime that Christ comes. But first, let's look at a few verses that tell us that Jesus comes as a thief in the night. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And here... God is speaking of the day of the Lord, Judgment Day, and Judgment Day began on May 21 of 2011. That, that's what the Bible tells us. As the, the information from the Bible locked in that day, and it's never been unlocked. No one has shown that the information is incorrect or in error, and that means that the Bible continues to insist that was the day of judgment. And so the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Did Christ come as a thief on May 21 of 2011? Yes. Well, if that's so, then did the, the heavens pass away with a great noise and the elements melt with fervent heat on that day? No. No, they didn't. Well, how did he come as a thief? And how did the rest of what we read here not occur on the day that he came as a thief? Well, it's because that Judgment Day is, well, uh, there's a likelihood it'll be for 1,600 days. And the first day of judgment is the same as the 1,600th day of judgment. It's all Judgment Day, even though it's a prolonged period of time. And so if Christ came spiritually as a thief to bring judgment on the world, May 21, and then if he destroys the world finally on the last day of that prolonged period of time, let's say in October 7th of 2015, then he came as a thief in judgment day and he destroyed the world in the day of judgment, just at the end of this, this extended uh, duration for Judgment Day. That's why it says in 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which 
in the which, in that period of judgment day, the heavens will be destroyed. Not necessarily, and it didn't happen that way at the very beginning, not after 800 days or wherever we're at in, in relationship to the beginning of judgment day, but finally at the end of this period of time, the heavens and the earth and the whole creation is destroyed and it was all the day of the Lord. And that's how God is, is um, uh, able to make these kinds of statements in one single verse, and yet it spans a period that, that likely is over four years in time. Well, let's also look at Revelation 16. Revelation 16 and in verse 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, the Lord here is saying he's coming as a thief, and the context of Revelation 16 is judgment day, and yet he's talking about keeping your garments. Your garments. If, if you don't keep your garments, you're going to walk naked. And what, is, what does that have to do with? Well, the covering of our sin, as nakedness in the Bible represents sin. And to cover our nakedness, our spiritual nakedness, we need the righteousness of Christ. That is our garment. Just like the man at the, um, the wedding feast, when, when the king came in and he saw the man without the proper garment, without the proper wedding garment, it's the same idea. And, and yet God is speaking of judgment day. He comes as a thief and there is an inspection of spiritual covering. You, you need to watch or else you will be found naked and then you, the shame of your sin will be exposed. And we wonder, well, why would God command us to watch at that particular time in the day of judgment? Why is it necessary then, certainly everybody who is saved is already saved, uh, and why uh, is there a concern for keeping your garment? Because it's a time of severe trial and testing. And it's a time when God is putting the fire to the profession of everyone's faith. And it's a time where it's going to be found out who is a true believer and who is not who is truly saved and who isn't. And, and so in that sense, many lose their garment and they begin to walk naked in, in their sins as, as God is um, discovering, as the day is revealing their actual spiritual condition. Well, let's also go to Revelation 3. And this is another statement concerning Christ coming as a thief in the night. And I'll start reading in verse 2. This is um, addressed to the angel of the church in Sardis. So it's addressed to the churches, to the churches and the congregations. Revelation 3, verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. If you do not watch, I will come as a thief, and you won't know the hour. Now, what's the implication there? It's not, it's not stated, but what's the implication? If you watch then you will know the hour. You will know when I come. If you don't watch, then I come as a thief. And God actually makes that distinction in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we read. As he said in verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. The true believers aren't overtaken as a thief. It's why? Because they were watching. And as, as Revelation 3.3 3 indicates, if you watch, then the implication is, 
uh, or let me read it again. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Uh, time and again, Jesus said, watch. In Matthew 24 and other places, watch therefore, for you know not the hour when the Son of Man cometh. And the churches and congregations and now some outside of the churches say, well, you can't know the day or hour, but you have to keep watch. Really? <laughs> what are you watching for? You, you can't know when the time is, but you're going to watch? That's like sending a watchman up in the tower, into the watchtower in, in uh, ancient times to keep an eye out for the enemy army, saying, you go up and watch, here's your trumpet, Here's your trumpet, and when you see the enemy coming, or if you think you see the enemy coming, make sure you don't blow it. And make sure you don't warn us, because actually you can't see the enemy coming. What's the sense of putting an individual as a watchman? As God said in Ezekiel 3, uh, he likens his people to watchmen, and when you see the sword come, you're to blow the trumpet and warn the people. And the only way you can do that is if the Bible, God who knows the end from the beginning, gives warning to you and he reveals the time. Or else uh, there, there's no other way of being a proper watchman. Because when you blow the trumpet, it has to be certain. Who takes warning? If uh, there's an uncertain sound, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, nobody, nobody. Is anyone taking warning that with the news that Christ could come at any day? The churches live just like the world because that doesn't um, do anything for them. That Christ could come today or tomorrow or next year or 10 years or 100 years. And, and now I'll, do, I'll live my life as I please is basically all that does. Well, well Revelation 3, 3 is saying, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. Who will Christ come as a thief upon? The churches. This is addressed to the church in Sardis. This is addressed to all the churches, as it says after each one of the seven addresses to the angels. I will come on thee as a thief if you don't watch. Because... Well, they, they were obligated to, to be faithful to the Word of God, to keep His commandments. God gave them space to repent. They did not repent, so He brought judgment on the churches. Look at Revelation 2 and uh, verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else... I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Speaking to the church. So God gave warning, I am going to come as a thief. And he did come as a thief in the night upon the churches and congregations back in 1988. He came as such an excellent thief such a, uh, an amazing thief. You know, the best thieves are the ones that don't sound the alarms. They don't, they don't set off the security system. The best thieves are the ones that do not get caught. And, and they're so expert in their ability to come and steal, you don't even know they were there. That would be the greatest crime. And the Lord Jesus Christ came as a thief on the churches and congregations and he removed the candlestick. He took away the light of the gospel from them. He removed salvation from their very presence. And they didn't know it. They had no clue. Not only, though, you know, we, we have to, uh, as they say, cut them some slack. Not only them, but true believers didn't know it either. We, we were, where were you if you were old enough back in 1988 or back in 1992 or back in 1995? In the church. In the church. In the church where God's spirit had departed out, where Satan's spirit had entered in, where God came as the judge 
and the church didn't know it. They were completely unaware and ignorant of it. And even the true believers didn't know it. Now, that is an expert thief. That he came and he stole um, everything. All the valuables, spiritually speaking, of all the churches and congregations of the world. And they didn't have a clue. And it, it, they, they still don't. Even up until today, you'll find many pastors, many church uh, members, many people that will tell you, come to our church. There was an individual sent me a, a note today on Facebook about their church, and I had to explain, no, I'm sorry, we, we're not members of the Church of Christ. We, it, we're not members of any church. The church age is over. Christ has judged the church and he's commanded his people to come out. And that's all a result of him coming in judgment as a thief. So when God says that he comes as a thief in the night in 1 Thessalonians 5, well, we have a, an example of him coming as a thief when he judged the churches and congregations and no one knew it. No one knew it. So now when we look at May 21, 2011, and, and you know, the world uh, uh, was holding its collective breath. The, the world was, uh, they, they tried not to act as if it was concerning them. But believe me, when they start having parties afterwards, they were disturbed. They were greatly disturbed. It was everywhere. And it never, never in the history of the world had the news of Judgment Day been proclaimed so far and wide to so many people, and they just couldn't get away from it. You know how uh, typically you talk to a person and he has no interest in the gospel? He'll just turn away from you and he'll, he'll start talking to his other friends. Well, if they turn to the left, they saw a billboard. If they turned to the right, they saw a t-shirt. It, it was really upsetting to them. Very upsetting. And then uh, May 21, 2011 came and apparently nothing happened. What a huge sigh of relief. What a tremendous cause of rejoicing and, and of uh, uh, just... Uh, letting their, their breath out and, and then continuing on with their life. Now that's over. Now we're past that. And, and actually, you know, the Bible says, never again are the people of the world going to fear the coming of God. It's never going to happen again. There will never be another instance like we witness in the days leading up to May 21. It says that in Luke 21, I think in verse 25 or 26, where it says men's hearts waxing cold from fear in the, in the Greek and from looking after those things coming upon the earth. They're going to wax cold because, all right, that was it. That was the most um, sincere. It was, it was extremely serious. These people meant it. They, they would say we were crazy, but they realized we weren't. They could see that we were very sound, and, and, and so it was a very um, disturbing thing to the people of the world. And, it, and when it didn't happen, according to their physical eyes, that's it. That was the last time. That was the last time that we're ever going to listen to anything like that. Have you tried talking to people? about anything related to the coming of the Lord since? Do you think, have they a moment for you? Um, uh, even people who profess to be true believers, who were hand in hand, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to uh, continue looking into the scriptures concerning these things. They've had it. Let, let, let's uh, talk about other things in the Bible. And really, they've gone back to uh, the the basics and and they don't want anything more to do with anything deeper or the meat of the word just 
let's talk about Christ. We can all agree on Him, and, and actually we can't. Because when you talk about Christ on the cross, can we agree that He died for sin on the cross? No, we can't. Because He didn't make payment for sin on the cross. He made payment from the foundation of the world. There, there is no agreement with light and darkness. There is no agreement with God's people and those that aren't God's people. And, and, and so we're living in this time, though, when the world feels extreme relief, and yet they don't know. They are unaware that Christ did come as a thief in the night. Now let's talk about the word night. The word night. In John 11, in John 11, in verses 9 and 10, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. So there's how many hours in a day? Twenty-four? Well, <laughs> not according to Christ. There's twelve hours in the day, because he's breaking up the day according to the time of daylight, and then comes the night. And, and so that's exactly half of a day, 12 hours. Or are there not 12 hours in the day? The Bible also says in John 9, in John 9, in verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Will somebody get that? <laughs> who's, who's ringing? Is that Chuck? Yes. Oh, right. you made your presence known. <laughs> well, it's good to see you, Chuck. All right. Uh, in John 9... I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh, when no man can work. Now, Jesus just told us there's 12 hours in the day. So he's going to work the works of him that sent me while it's day, the night comes, and no man can work. Now, he goes on to say in verse 6, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. He then gives sight to the blind. That's the works of him that sent him to give sight to the blind, to save, to save souls. And that's what that's a picture of. For instance, in John chapter 6, in verse 28, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. So the work of God is that ye believe. Of course, it's not a work that we can do. It's a work that Christ had to do. We're not saved by our own faith, but by the faith of Christ. And again, in John 11, I must work the works of him that sent me, while it's day. And what is that work? That ye believe. So that is telling us that salvation takes place during the day, the 12 hours. And that's why it's called the day of salvation. The night comes and no man can work. After the 21st, is that what that means? I'm sorry? After the 21st, then no man can Help yes, yes, after May 21st. And uh, let's go to um, Matthew chapter 20. In Matthew 20, we find a parable of a householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And it says in verse 3 of Matthew 20, and he went out about the third hour. And what time would that be, the third hour? Nine. Nine. Because the day starts at six. The third hour is 9 a.m. And then verse 5, again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour. So that's 12 and 3 p.m. And did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? 
So he hires these men who are standing around idle all day at the 11th hour. And how long did they work? One hour. And we don't have to guess because it says in verse 9, And when they came, they were hired about the 11th hour. They received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. They were hired at the 11th hour, 5 p.m. They worked one hour, 6 p.m., and then it was time to give the payment to all the servants, because that was it. Jesus already said, are there not 12 hours in the day? The work day is 12 hours long, 6 to 6. And then at 6 p.m., everyone gets their payment. Everyone who worked in the vineyard, and everyone gets the same payment. And, and one of the points of this parable is to point out that the reward for all of God's people is the same. It's eternal life. And it doesn't matter if someone labored 80 years or someone labored 80 days. If in the gospel, God saved them. They all get equal payment of eternal life. But another point of the parable is to teach us about the length of a work day and that it's 12 hours. And especially, you know, it's interesting that the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, three hour increments nicely spaced, but then the 11th hour, it, it, it's, uh, it's off, um, it, it's out of the ordinary. It, it just kind of comes there at the end of the day. And they work only for one hour, and these were people who were idle. Why does God emphasize that 11th hour, that last hour, that one hour? Because it typifies the Great Tribulation. The rest of the day typifies the church age, the, when it, it was um, normative to send forth the gospel, and laborers were in the churches and congregations. But at the end, there's something different. If we turn to Revelation 18, in verse 10, it says, Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, this is describing Babylon's destruction, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Babylon endured for one hour, or um, the uh, exaltation of Satan in his kingdom was greatest during the hour of great tribulation, as he was the beast ruling in the churches, he was ruling in the world, in an in a unparalleled way. And then judgment came at the end of that hour, at the end of the work day. So the, the end of the great tribulation, the end of that figurative one hour, and, and remember Revelation 8, 1, silence in heaven about the space of half an hour, because it was related to the first part of the great tribulation, as the great tribulation is an entire hour. At the end of that hour is the end of the workday. Then comes the night. Then comes Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun is darkened and the moon will not give her light. And uh, notice back in Genesis 1, in uh, verse 5, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Immediately after the tribulation, the sun is darkened. Spiritual darkness comes upon the world. The darkness is night. This is the time of night. And what did Jesus say? I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes... And no man can work. That's exactly what we've been understanding that on May 21, 2011, why that day? Because that was the exact 23rd year 
of the Great Tribulation. It was the exact 8400th day of the Great Tribulation. It had the underlying Hebrew calendar date of 217, exactly 7,000 years from the flood when God shut the door of heaven on the 17th day of the second month. And God indicated that is the end of the Great Tribulation. That is the end of the day of salvation, the end of the 12-hour workday, and the beginning of the spiritual night that we have entered into since that time. Let's um, look at this from another angle. Well, l let me just explain first. Uh, as far as the historical type and figure of the Great Tribulation, there is the 70 years that um, Judah, Judah was being judged by God, and so they came under the power and the authority of the Babylonians. And the king of Babylon typified Satan as he uh, was given power over Judah, over Jerusalem, over the people of God. And then at the end of the 70 years, that would typify the end of the Great Tribulation, as those 70 years typify the Great Tribulation. And then at the end of 70 years, from 609 B.C. through 539 B.C., the Medes and the Persians came and conquered Babylon. And the, the king of the Medes and the Persians, Cyrus, is a type of Christ. And um, we can see that, for instance, in Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44, verse 28, the last verse of the chapter, which says that, saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. And then Isaiah 45, verse 1, that saith, Thus saith Jehovah to his anointed, that's the word Messiah in Daniel, to his Messiah, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden. Cyrus is the anointed. He is God's shepherd. He is the one at the end of 70 years conquered Babylon and took the kingdom of Babylon. And um, not only that, go to Isaiah 13. And Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1 tells us the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. As we've learned that Babylon typifies Satan's kingdom of this world. And, and uh, then in this chapter, uh, we read in verse 9, Behold, the day of Jehovah cometh. The, verse 10, the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened. We recognize the language of Matthew 24, 29. Verse 11, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. Not, not the church, the world. This is the burden of Babylon. And then in this context, verse 17, behold, I will stir up the Medes against them which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb, and their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Why would you bring up the king of the Medes, or the Medes? Because... The king of the Medes, Cyrus, also known as Darius, typifies Christ. They conquered Babylon, which is the world or Satan's kingdom, at the end of 70 years, which typifies the Great Tribulation. And, and so Isaiah 13 is bringing those two ideas together in this chapter, the destruction or fall of Babylon with the judgment of God upon the world. And the Medes and Persians are very important. They are representative of the kingdom of God ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go to Daniel in Daniel chapter 5. And this is when the king of Babylon, it's not Nebuchadnezzar, it's one of his descendants, Belshazzar. Belshazzar the king, he, he was having a party with a thousand of his lords. They were drinking wine. They, they were having a good time. And then he saw the writing on the wall, and he was troubled, and his knees began to knock together. 
Uh, he, was, he was so nervous, it, it, it disturbed him so much that his knees knocked together. And then uh, his princess comes and tells him of Daniel, who interprets things like that. And Daniel comes to give the king the interpretation. In Daniel 5, verse 25, and this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius, also known as Cyrus, the Median, took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Do you see how this is picturing Christ coming as a thief in the night? In that night. You know, Babylon historically was taken by surprise. The, the incredibly, an army like the Medes and the Persians marched upon Babylon and, and took them with very little bloodshed. All we read of is the king of Babylon was slain because they came upon them in the night. They were having a party. They, they were rejoicing, drinking wine. Everything was going well until the vision of the writing on the wall. And uh, normally they would have watchmen that would see the enemy army coming afar off. And if any indicator of an army like the Medes and the Persians was anywhere near the city, they, they would have been on high alert and they would have been defending their city. But none of that. He was killed in that night because it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ coming as a thief in the night. And Darius the Median, Cyrus, God's shepherd, his anointed, takes the kingdom of Babylon. So this is picturing what happened on May 21, 2011, when Judgment Day took place. Satan, typified by the king of Babylon, was put down. Christ now became ruler over Babylon or over this world, over all that Satan once ruled over. Now, come on, come on. It's maybe somebody's heard me say this before and, and they just shake their head. Are you kidding? Look at this world. Do you know how much grief, how much trouble how, how difficult it's been to live in this world since May 21, 2011, and you're trying to tell me that Satan was put down and Christ was exalted? Yes. Now let's, let's look at Daniel. Daniel, the most faithful man we could probably find in the Bible. He lived in Babylon most of his life, and it, it was a grievous period of time for him, I'm sure, even though... He, God prospered him. He would always be lifted up. And, and yet, now let's ask the question. When did the most difficult time of Daniel's life take place? Was it under King Nebuchadnezzar, who is a type of Satan? No. It's after the Medes and the Persians took the kingdom, and it's after this King Darius... Well, Darius didn't like Daniel then. Well, no, Darius highly respected Daniel. And Dan, in Daniel 6, it says in verse 1, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. He found favor in the sight of the kings of the Medes and the Persians. The king of the Medes and the Persians was completely on Daniel's side. He was behind him, supporting him, and he trusted Daniel. And yet, despite that, due to circumstances, 
of those uh, princes and their jealousy, and, and they lay a trap for the king and Daniel by uh, enacting that law that no man may make request of any god save of you, O king, for 30 days. And then Daniel continues to do what he's always done, and that is be a faithful man of God. He continues to pray, and as a result of his faithfulness, as a result of his um, steadfastness to God and to God's word, he will experience the darkest time of his whole life during the period after the 70 years, during a time when the king of Babylon isn't a problem anymore, during a time when Cyrus, Darius, is ruling the kingdom, someone who views him favorably because God is teaching us this is the situation for his people in that night, in this day of judgment, throughout this period of time. It is as though, well, Daniel is typifying the elect of God that will be sorely tried and tested as Daniel was, as he, he never had been before. Let's look at um, Daniel 6 and verse 16. Well, no, verse 14 first. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. So the king was was arguing with those men who had tricked him all day long. And it wasn't until the sun went down and night came that finally he realized that, that he has no choice because the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be altered, just like the word of God. You can't change the word of God. So he had no choice. He had to follow through uh, with what the law commanded. And so in verse 16, then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. How long was Daniel in the lion's den? Overnight. All night long. All night long. Uh, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the day of salvation, which ended on May 21, 2011. The night cometh where no man can work. But what will happen during that night? Well, you're going to be, and I'm going to be, and every believer is going to be cast into a lion's den. Spiritually, of course. And, and keep in mind, lions in the Bible, just read Psalm 22. They gaped upon me with open mouths as a roaring and raving lion. He, God wasn't talking about an animal. He was talking about people people. And, and that's exactly uh, what has been happening. It, it's the, the mouths of people that, that have those sharp teeth that has been uh, coming against the children of God. So the king passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions and when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. So that's what the time of testing will show. If, if we're a true man, if we are innocent, 
as far as our sins go. If we're faithful to God, it's going to reveal all those things and it's going to also show that God is able to keep us and, and, and to keep us safe. It says in 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4, where the Apostle Paul, remember, is a pattern of believers. And, and we, we know that, that Christ uh, had experience with lions, but so do true believers. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 16, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles or nations might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That, that's referring to being delivered from wicked men. And, and uh, again, Paul is an example of the true believers. Let me just look at one more verse before we, we close. In Psalm 17, in Psalm 17, Guy mentioned this psalm earlier today, and it is a prayer of David. And um, notice uh, verse 9, From the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about, they are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. And then verse 12, Like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places, Arise, O Jehovah, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. So again, God is likening the wicked to the lion. Now look at verse 3, Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in the night, thou hast tried me, and shall find nothing. I am purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. This is, this is what is happening for all God's people, for all the true believers. God is proving and trying us in the spiritual night that has come upon the world. And uh, we know that uh, the morning comes, and early in the morning, just, just as the believers ran early in the morning to the tomb, to see what had happened to Christ when he rose from the dead early Sunday morning, it's sort of reversed. Now it's the believers that are in the night. And it's God typified by King Darius or Cyrus who comes to the, the lion's den early in the morning to see how Daniel did. And God will take his people out of this situation at the first available instant. Well, let's uh, stop here and we'll close with a word of prayer and then uh, we'll have lunch soon. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, all of your blessings to us, all of your help, uh, and we thank you for your guidance. And Father, we pray that you would bless everyone here. We pray for uh, Bill and Anita, and uh, we pray that you would bless their family and comfort them and help them uh, through, through this difficult time. And we pray for Mike and his family, and we pray that you would bless them also and, and comfort them and that you would be with them uh, as only you can be. And, and uh, Father, we... Uh, we fail at, at comfort, but you are the great comforter. So we pray that your spirit would uh, comfort the souls of your people. And uh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this day that you've given where we can concentrate on your word and spend time in it. And may you bless it to our hearts. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.